Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, today's seminar, um, it gives a, a pleasure to introduce Cameron Bertosa, uh, who joined my group about 10 months ago, um, virtually. Um, so I, I think I met him when he came for a student visit right before the pandemic, and then uh, we spent about the first year working together on Zoom, which I did not really enjoy that much, but Cameron was able to make the most of that time, was very successful during that time. And then I think the next time we met was actually at the Terrace when we had our first group get together when the COVID numbers started to improve a little bit last summer. Um, but anyway, uh, Cameron comes uh, from originally from Florida, but went to Cornell University where he did an uh, undergraduate in atmospheric science, graduating in 2020. Uh, throughout his time at Cornell and also in high school, uh, he was quite an accomplished rower um and has since coming to madison i guess shifted his focus to what trail running and uh triathlons so uh like many of you here that impress the heck out of me that they're able to run a triathlon or a two triathlon um so uh the, the one other little tidbit that um, he shared with me recently was that um apparently cameron has a very balanced diet um he doesn't like vegetables but he also doesn't like sweet stuff and so basically between the two he kind of balances out and just in the middle <laughs> i learned that last semester <laughs> um yeah <laughs> so anyway um like i said since cameron's been here he's been extremely successful um on research uh and he is uh, helping contribute to the pre-fire mission through a very critical step actually in our data processing which is whenever we have a field of view observed by pre-fire, we need to know whether or not there's a cloud present in order to understand which algorithms to run after that clear sky or cloud sky algorithms. And so he's gonna to talk to you today about his work uh, developing a neural network cloud mask for the pre-fire satellite mission. Go ahead, Cameron. Thanks for the introduction. After hearing this last semester, we're starting to dig into my uh, kind of embarrassing context. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, uh, this might be a, a, a bit of a double header from the colloquium Monday, if you're able to attend. So I'm going to be talking about some of my master's work, which was looking at seeing if we could use these neural networks to create these sort of skillful cloud maps for the pre-fire mission. And so uh, maybe starting with some background on the mission and, and, and some of the objectives, uh, we can start with just sort of basic principles where much of the temperatures that occur on Earth, we know that kind of the bulk of the thermal emission occurs between these wavelengths of order of 100 microns. And, and uh, you know, where relatively colder temperatures will emit a relatively greater proportion of their uh, emission at uh, longer wavelengths than those of, of warmer temperatures. And, and while the uh, the kind of mid-infrared portion of the spectrum, which will define as 4 to 15 microns, is been quite extensively measured and, and studied. Uh, the, the far infrared portion, which will define as longer than 15 uh, microns, is, is far less so. And that's, uh, again, due to you know a number of reasons, one of which being kind of these instrument limitations, where uh, it's, it's typically harder to get the same sensitivity in the far infrared as you might in the, in the mid infrared, uh, but also being uh, because uh, water vapor is quite strongly absorbing in the far infrared. And so you could especially imagine in, in these orbiting missions where you're you're getting kind of top-down view of the atmosphere over, over much of the globe, you might get a relatively opaque view of the surface. Uh, and, and, and while that might be characteristic of, of a lot of these locations, we know that's not really characteristic of everywhere. So you can imagine for the polar regions, for example, uh, they're quite typically dry, and so that might imply some some greater use of, of these far infrared measurements. And, and not only that, but we can kind of go back to our, our basic principles and, and, and look at this plot on the right here from Lechley et al, where they're kind of plotting these, these three different characteristic spectra at these three different temperatures. And you see for kind of our coldest representation uh, for Antarctica in September in blue, we see uh, there's, you know, overall kind of a, a lower magnitude of emission, but a greater proportion occurring at these these longer wavelengths, and, and specifically in the far infrared portion of the spectrum, we're getting nearly 60% of our emission. And so you, you can imagine not only is the uh, uh, far infrared perhaps being able to be used in these regions, but uh, kind of has the biggest implications where, uh, you know, even small errors in, in what we're assuming the emission to be and, and what it actually is uh, kind of gets magnified when 
when such a great proportion occurs at these wavelengths. And so ultimately, Free Fire kind of aims to fill this gap in, in, in these observations. And, and the way in which it, it will do that is it's going to have these two uh, identi identical CubeSat spacecraft uh, in, in these different orbits. And, and so these are these small stats, roughly the size of a shoebox. Uh, and each one of these is, is going to carry one of these uh, miniaturized turret instruments where that instrument will cover 5 to 54 microns with a, a spectral sampling of 0.86 microns, so you know roughly 50 to 60 channels. And, and the field of view of, of our instrument will be uh, 12 to 15 kilometers. And so uh, you can imagine uh, with with two satellites in different orbits, we're not going to only have kind of this better climatological understanding of you know various surfaces under various conditions, but also you know as, as one spacecraft crosses over a region, the other spacecraft will kind of intersect that path some some number of hours later, and, and you can kind of make inferences and processes that are occurring, or or uh, you know what those processes are leading to. And so uh, kind of the, the overarching goal of this mission is, is to use these measurements not only to better understand polar climate, but also these polar processes. And so while that's you know, quite an encompassing goal, there's a bunch of different people or teams working on you know, different aspects of this, some of which are in the room, uh, but I'll kind of focus specifically on, on this cloud aspect where you can imagine uh, for someone wanting to extract like surface information, this emissivity values, we want to ensure that you know to those algorithms, you're only passing through footprints that are truly representative of clear footprints that are seen in the surface, and, and not something that's actually a cloud and perhaps giving your results in some way. Um, and then similarly with with these, uh, uh, you know, someone trying to extract. Uh, cloud microphysical information, uh, you want to ensure that you pass through true clouds to those uh, to those algorithms. And so kind of uh, let's say we, we want to be able to design this cloud map to, to sort those those into the two different types. And so uh, of course there's there's a bit of a wrinkle to this and, and that's that uh, clouds in the polar regions are are quite often difficult to detect. Um, and it's and it's not unusual for you know a a typical cloud mass to have some of its least skill in, in these locations. And again, that's that's due to a variety of reasons. Kind of the simplest case you can imagine though is you know with, with your typical warm region, uh, the warm surface emits at a very different temperature than uh, your than your kind of cold cloud top. And and while that's you know relatively obvious in our in our warm regions, uh, for polar regions oftentimes it's you know ice or snow covered surfaces and and so the, those cloud tops on the surface might be of very similar temperatures, or even in the case of you know environmental temperature aversions and, and low clouds, you might actually get a cloud top that's warmer than your, your surface. Um, but again, the, the far infrared might, might be our friend here, where uh, there's been some evidence that uh, the polar surfaces exhibit kind of these distinct spectral signatures uh, in the far infrared. And so you can imagine if if we can identify what that pattern is and, and our instrument captures that pattern, we can say, okay, we're not being obstructed from that pattern by you know something like a cloud. And so we can we can link it to such. Uh, and then similarly with, with ice clouds, uh, the farm thread it has these you know distinct signatures to those ice clouds. And, and if we can identify what that pattern is and we find it, we can uh, classify it as such. And so uh, we we can kind of start to bring in neural networks here, and, and they're quite well known for being able to, you know, I, uh, identify these small signal signals and, and link them to these kind of expected outputs. And so we want to kind of see if we can take advantage of that in, in some way. And so uh, again, this this might be a, a bit of review from Wednesday or from Monday, but um, I'll just kind of define the basics of a neural network at, at least in the form in which we'll be using them. I think they can take uh, kind of a lot of different forms, but we'll de just define it as a system with, you know, some number of inputs that uh, attached to those inputs are, are these weights or coefficients. 
which are combined in, in some unique way to spit out a, a, an output or a prediction of some sort by our model. And ultimately, uh, those, those weights are updated in some way to try to minimize the, uh, some sort of user-defined error function or, or loss function. And uh, in, in our application to prefire, we'll, we'll, we'll create this such that our, our inputs are simply our radiances for each of our footprints. So, you know, we'll have 50 to 60 inputs. And then while it's nice to have, you know, a, a model that returns, rather those are represented as something that's clear or cloudy, uh, ultimately it's, you know, important to have some notion of uncertainty associated with that. And so we can take it slightly further and design a model that returns the probability that it's clear, the probability that it's cloudy, where, you know, these probabilities will sum to one. And so uh, we'll, we'll define our, our loss function as this quite commonly used one called binary cross entropy, which is, is just defined in such a way that, for example, our, our model will get penalized more if it makes a highly confident prediction that ends up being incorrect than if it made that same prediction with, with some lower amount of confidence or vice versa. If it makes a, a highly confident prediction that ends up being correct, it gets rewarded more than if if it made that same prediction with, with lower confidence. And let's say we're, we're trying to kind of fully utilize these, uh, these return confidences by our model. And so uh, kind of in, in lieu of the fact that the V-Fire satellites have, have yet to be launched, we have to use uh, simulated spectra in, in some way. And so how we do that is we use this uh, GFDL model output, which kind of on this fine spatial scale where uh, the grid boxes are three by three kilometers. And that essentially kind of creates these atmospheric states at a bunch of different time steps. And, and, and from that um, simulation, we can uh, pass it through this, to this uh, principal component uh, based radiative transfer model and derive some sort of, you know, upwelling radiance for each of those grid boxes. And, and uh, uh, the this, this same radiative transfer model has been used in uh, a number of these uh, IR radiance studies. And so uh, I'm, I'm just plotting here for our variables from our GFDL output from a particular time step, which might go into calculating that upwelling radiance and just trying to show at least some amount of uh, the kind of inhomogeneity or time scale spatial structures that are occurring even just at this single time step in, in, in just this portion of the domain. And so that's, that's just kind of to say we're sampling a lot of these different atmospheric states uh, with, with this simulation. And, and um, well, that, that, that uh, GFD output is, uh, GFDL output is, is nice. We need to uh, be a, a bit careful uh, because those grid boxes are, are quite a bit smaller than what our tourist footprint will be capturing. And so we uh, try to stimulate some sort of inhomogeneity that, that might be present um, within one of our tourist footprints in, in reality. And so the way we do that is uh, we kind of create these patches, as, as I call them, um, basically of these three by three different, uh, of three by three groups of the GFDL, GFDL output. And so uh, we can see that here in these panels. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of focus on these blue rings. Uh, and so this is going to represent one of our orbit paths, where uh, the orbit is just you know progressing along bands of latitude essentially. And uh, yeah, so it's moving west to east, and we can zoom in on any particular point of that orbit and uh, see what's happening. And so. This kind of checkerboard pattern in the background is going to represent what our GFDL grid size is. And then from that, you can kind of see these, these larger blue squares uh, are representing what our, our TURS footprint size is. And so it's covering kind of these three by three patches of these. And so we can zoom in on any one of those given patches and see what's occurring. And, and you know, within any given patch, there might be some spread uh, in the radiances among the nine grid boxes. But ultimately, we kind of just take the average among those nine grid boxes to 
generate some sort of mean spectrum representative of that footprint. <clears throat> and you know, as as with any instrument, there's going to be some noise associated with each of our measured channels, and and so we can uh, and and we have estimates of what those noise values should be, and so we can kind of add that into our our model during training and evaluation, and, and see what effect it has, or or try to make it ro more robust through that noise. And so ultimately, that, that spectrum with noise um, is what passed through to our, our model, and it, and it predicts whether that, you know, force and footprint is something that's represented clear or something that's represented cloudy. And, and so uh, this being kind of a polar-oriented mission, I, I, I create kind of a polar-targeted cloud mask in, in the sense that I'm only using those, those grid boxes forward of 60 degrees, both in the northern hemisphere portion and, and so like every and as well as um, everywhere south of 60 south. And so ultimately this kind of results in uh, eight million different spectra for the model to both be trained and evaluated on. And that's quite nice because oftentimes these NNs work better with you know the more different samples you can pass through to them, as well as the fact that we got you know quite a large sample size to kind of make conclusions from. And so uh, the final kind of piece to this puzzle uh, is it's choosing what you want to define actually as, as a cloud. And, and this, this answer is not immediately obvious. Um, where, for example, the, the GFDL simulation simply defines a cloud as you know, some grid box that contains some non-pure value and the uh, ice or liquid water content. And you know, while that might be appropriate, and, a modeling context. It's, it's not really quite physical in the sense that a lot of those values are probably far below what we would even hope our instrument being able to detect. And so what we choose to do is, is we use the total water path, so the ice, the sum of the ice and liquid water path, and, and we want to define some threshold. And if our if our footprint has a total water path above that threshold, we define it as cloud, and if it's below that threshold, we define it as clear. Um, however, even uh, the selection of what that threshold should be is, is not really immediately obvious, where you, know, you can see here for the liquid and ice water path at just this time step over just you know the northern hemisphere polar region, uh, that value might uh, kind of vary by orders of magnitude. And so we go about trying to derive some, some sort of optimal threshold uh, for what we define as clear cloudy. And, and we define optimal as, you know, both trying to take advantage of, of our terrorist instrument sensitivity as, as well as, you know, our, our model's ability to pick up on these patterns and, and return some useful form of, of confidence um, in its predictions. And so, uh, again, this, this will have several implications. Um, in, in the selection of this threshold where, you know, you can imagine if we select the threshold too high, clouds with sort of these notable radiator effects or we'll, la we'll labeling as clear and, and that can have these kind of downstream effects in, in those clear sky retrieval algorithms. Uh, and then if we label this threshold too low, we kind of go back to our GFDL case where it's, it's not really physically used. Um, and so what we do is, is we try to keep you know everything constant essentially, but we, we we train a bunch of distinct models with these varying thresholds of, of what we define as clear and cloudy for both the the training of that model and as well as the evaluation. And and we see how you know our loss, which again should be a function of our model's ability to you know detect whether those scenes are clear or cloudy and, re and return some useful form of confidence. We see how that changes and. Uh, specifically, we're trying to find a minimum this loss function because that's uh, representing kind of the most uh, the most scale. And so, uh, one final thing though is we need to be a bit careful uh, with this notion of, of class imbalance, where you can imagine if, if we set a, uh, a a threshold such that we have a hundred times as many cloud footprints as we do clear footprints, there could be some kind of artificial form of scale simply by predicting cloud a hundred times itself. And so, uh, quite easily with um, you know the package that we've used to create these neural networks, we can we can introduce this class weighting where, uh, for example, in that same predict or that same example of there being 
a hundred times as many cloud footprints, what we can do is we can say, okay, a clear prediction is worth a hundred times as much. Um, and, and that's again to, you know, kind of remove this imbalance. So uh, finally, we can go up to this panel A here and, and uh, we'll, we'll just look at the blue line. And, and so each of the X's are, are one of our distinct models that we train at that corresponding total water path threshold. And then they evaluate the loss, where again, these uh, lower values are better. And, and we see quite clearly a, a bowl is kind of formed as, as it approaches what we think to be these optimal values. And, and, it, and it fits, or it, it uh, has a minimum at a value of four grams per meter squared, but uh, the bowl being as shallow as it is, and, and also the fact that um, these clear sky algorithms can be quite sensitive to even some of these thinner uh, clouds. We, we try to be more aggressive in the sense of, uh, that we go to the left of this bowl and, and choose a value that's just shy of, of our absolute minimum and, and, and pick this value 1.4 grams per meter squared as, as our, uh, as our you know, designation of whether it's clear or cloudy. And so kind of going forth with uh, the study, um, if, if we define a cloud, it's, it's meaning that the, the total water path of that scene is is above that value, and if it's clear, it's below that value. Cameron? Yep. Can you start with just the minimum threshold for the instrument and then iterate towards these assignments? Is that kind of how you do it, or do you... I mean, I, I know I'm asking a naive question, but it sounds like there's lots of knobs you can twist here, and you want to minimize how many of them you have freedom with. And it would seem to me that if, if you know your instrument can't detect a cloud below a certain threshold, that whole universe is out and then everything higher than that is in, but can you use that as the base from which you iterate towards an answer that keeps all these other things in consideration? So, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I have a good answer. because I don't know if necessarily we know what our minimum instruments detectability is going to be to start. With. Oh, okay, okay, I thought that maybe that was fair to say. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So the, the problem is it actually depends. It varies from cloud to cloud. High clouds, we may be able to detect thinner ones oh, than okay. low clouds, okay. that sort of thing. So I think you have to do this ensemble-based thing to find out where that threshold is. Okay. okay. It's, not a, it's, yeah, it's not a yes or no, black or white answer. So. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we, we finally can kind of see how our, our model behaves. Um, and so, this is with a, uh, uh, an evaluated field using that, that threshold, where uh, the left is going to be our true field as we defined it, where anywhere in white is it's saying this is cloudy, and anywhere in black it's, it's saying this is clear. And then um, the middle panel is, is representing what uh, a model trained with that same threshold kind of predicts. And you can see there's quite a lot of similarities. Um, there's definitely some differences, though. Uh, I, I think you can see some of the influence of, of the noise that we've added to the spectra, which I think is kind of exhibited by some of this, you know, fuzziness that you see. Uh, but there's also just some regions where our, our model misses it entirely, essentially, where like, specifically the kind of center portion of the domain, you see these clear or these broken clear and cloud features, and, and you know, maybe our model kind of picks on that, picks up on that somewhat, but. Uh, it, it sort of misses it entirely. And so um, kind of as we go, we'll, we'll keep specifically that portion of the, of the domain in mind. Um, and then also we can, we can see how uh, our model predicts the probabilities. Um, you know, that's one of our outputs. And so, you know, for example, anywhere in dark blue, our model is confident that it's cloud there. Anywhere in dark red, our model is confident that it's clear. And, and anywhere in white, it's you know uncertain, rel uh, relatively uncertain, one way or the other. So quite often times, our, our model's uh, quite confident in its prediction, but I think especially around where it predicts the cloud edge, um, you'll see that uh, there, there's a lot of this white, and, and that's you know maybe not surprising. You can imagine if if we've got a footprint that's truly covering the cloud edge. Uh, and, and half of it's clear and half of it's cloudy, that, that might induce some uncertainty for the model. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we, we dug deeper a bit into these, in these, uh, into these return confidences, and, and we find they have quite an intuitive meaning um, or interpretation where, for example, if, 
If our model assigns a confidence of 0.95 to our class, it, it corresponds to 95% of the time the, the prediction should be correct. And kind of linked to that same statistic, we we find um, that these these predictions that it makes that are typically correct or that are correct are typically assigned a higher confidence than, than those incorrect predictions. And, and so we, we can kind of just say that um, these assigned probabilities and return probabilities by the end end are quite trustworthy and you know intuitive to use uh, for the user and are likely a good option for you know perhaps attaching some quality flags to these outputs where you know you could imagine perhaps someone wants to say okay I only want to use these outputs that have a confidence of 0.95 or above or, or something like that. Uh, and so uh, kind of beyond this qualitative sense, uh, you know, just looking at these pretty pictures, we can we can do this a bit more quantitatively, where we'll we'll look at you know this confusion matrix, which is quite often used, uh, where it's it's showing our true negative rate and, and our true positive rate, where we hope these to be close to one uh, in a more skillful model. And and the and on the off diagonal it's our false positive and false uh, negative rate and we hope to be that those to be close to zero. Uh, and, and, you know, you can look at those how you'd like, but uh, I'll specifically point out um, uh, and for this model, our, our true positive and our true negative rate are quite similar to each other. And I think that's a function of that class weighting procedure that we that we did during the model training. Um, uh, and then uh, we can kind of further break down these scenes, for example, by looking at uh, Spinning kind of by the total water path of the scene, as well as by the you know some estimated cloud top height for pressure based on the model data. Where uh, we'll, we'll look at this uh, first panel or this big panel here to start with. Um, and so everywhere to the right of this line of this line T, uh, we hope to see dark shades of blue because it's it's indicating that the model is confidently predicting cloud there and. And to the right of this line is where we truly define cloud based on on, a, on that total water path threshold. And similarly, with with uh, to the left of this line, we hope to see dark shades of red. Those are true clear scenes as we define them. And so, uh, you know, we can kind of quickly walk through this and and see, for example, that our model uh, is is more confident that it's a cloudy scene when as the total water path kind of increases or our clouds maybe get more opaque or as well as the fact that you know as these as these clouds occur higher in the atmosphere um they, they pose to have a greater signal and, and and our model can kind of pick up on that and, and more confidently predict them than cloudy which again perhaps is not a surprising result um and and uh panels b and c are are kind of just complementary where it's essentially showing rather than confidence the, it, it's showing the accuracy of some along these um, these rows and these columns, where, for example, our, our you know mid to high altitude clouds are very often detected um, versus some lower percentage by these low clouds, and then again our, our very opaque uh, clouds are detected to a greater extent than than those near the threshold that we we've set. Um, and so uh, it, it's nice to see uh, that this model is exhibiting some amount of skill. Uh, quite often, though, you know, it's, it's people using these neural networks are interested in some relative importance of some of these inputs. And so, you know, in our case, we wanted to see uh, what effect removing the farm thread channel, for example, um, had on our model skill. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's Perhaps worth noting that you know uh, quite often times the events can be sensitive to changes in model model architecture. So you know that's the shape of the model, and and while I think that uh, poses a greater threat to something like a convolutional neural network, uh, these kind of just dense networks I think are less of a risk. But it, it it's still probably worth worth pointing out where you know we're we're changing our slate our shape slightly, and so we should be a bit careful. Uh, with the results. Um, so uh, uh, since I'm maybe a bit behind, I, I'm going to just kind of summarize this slide, where what we end up finding actually is, is you know, our, and kind of the bulk statistics of, of detecting clouds, our, our cloud detection rate is actually very similar, um, whether it's being through the far infrared or not. 
uh, and, and correctly identifying clear seams, however, we, we see a 3% drop if we don't include the far infrared. So, you know, the far infrared's contributing uh, 3% to uh, detecting these, truly detecting these clear seams, which, you know, maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but you could imagine our, our incorrect detections are, are relatively low to begin with, and so a 3% increase to that is, is quite large. Um, and again, that, that kind of aligns with some of the literature where these distinct signatures are present within the farm thread, and so if we don't uh, present that as to our model, you know, we can't pick up on those. Um, in, in terms of the, the cloud uh, detection being relatively equal, uh, we, we can break it up into kind of two more general categories for cloudy, where the, if, if these clouds occur, you know, uh, mid to high in the atmosphere versus those low clouds, what we actually find is for those mid to high altitude clouds, uh, the far infrared does contribute some skill um, in detecting those clouds, and, and specifically those, those clouds that are thin. And, and again, that kind of aligns with some of the literature that we've looked at, where the, these thin ice clouds, for example, exhibit um, some distinct spectral signatures in the far infrared. But you can imagine for, for those clouds quite close to the surface, you know, we, we know that uh, water vapor is strongly absorbing in the far infrared. Um, and, and, and so, you know, if those clouds are below some, some larger amount of water vapor, they might not have the signal to even begin with. And so, you know, the far infrared is essentially acting as just only a means of confusing the model for those, those low altitude clouds. And so kind of those opposing effects end up evening out and washing each other out and, and just kind of the general cloud protection. Um, and so uh, we ultimately wanted to then kind of conclude with seeing if we could expand upon this, you know, baseline full spectrum model in, in some way. And so uh, uh, we kind of explore these two main pathways, the first one being kind of the fact that our, our, our footprints overlap as a function of our, our TERS readout timing, and, and I'll, I'll maybe show or explain quickly what exactly that means on the next slide. But the second second kind of pathway being maybe this more intuitive one where uh, along with uh, along with our mission, we're going to have this OCMET product, which you know essentially maps NWP output um, of several atmosphere variables onto, onto our footprints. And so, you know, you can imagine if, if we can take several of those NWP outputs and, and pass them through as inputs as well, does it improve our model in some way? And so, uh, again, in, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to mainly focus on, on that first pathway with the overlapping footprint. So I, I think that's the Wooler pathway, uh, and, and I think it's a bit more new or interesting. Uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of just loop that more intuitive second, second point um, in at the end when we kind of evaluate the skill. And so uh, what I mean by this readout time thing is, is uh, for example, our terror's readout time, the instrument's readout time is exactly one third of the time it uh, takes to progress, you know, one full footprint. And so what ultimately that leads to is, is we have our, our footprints specifically overlapping by two thirds. So you can imagine as, you know, our, our satellite chugs along here, uh, our footprints aren't exactly lining up, you know, perfectly distinct from one another, but rather there's there's some overlap from the previous footprint. And so um, what we wanted to see is if, if we could exploit that in some way. And so again, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go back to this, this figure here, very similar to what I started with, where we'll have just, you know, one example orbit path that's progressing along these lines of latitude. Um, and west to east, and, and again, our, 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 we'll zoom in on one portion of that, and we have our GFDL grid, and then uh, we kind of have, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just point out a, a set of three particular footprints, where you know we have one three by three footprint in red, one in blue, and one in green. And specifically, you'll see uh, for, for these three footprints, there's actually a portion of the domain that's overlapped by all three, uh, and that's kind of this golden region. And that's, again, a function of, of them uh, having kind of this shared area uh, to begin with. And so what we wanted to see if we could do is, is, is rather than kind of just passing through these footprints individually or independently of one another, uh, can we actually 
pass through these sets of three um, and, and predict on kind of this subgroupment scale only that only that portion in which is overlapped overlapped by all three. And so you know not only does this have the advantage of you know predicting a, a size smaller than a single footprint, but we're also hoping kind of to you know maybe maybe this beats down the 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 noise that might be present within any individual footprint. Um, and so uh, you know rather than our input just being a single spectrum, it, it becomes the set of three that that's then passed through to to our model. And then, yeah, kind of as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to show now some some of the same scale metrics for a model that uses its overlapping procedure, as well as the fact uh, that it's going to include two of these NWP outputs, and then specifically the the total column water vapor for the footprint, as well as some some surface the the surface temperature. And and uh, again, we you know like our instrument, there's going to be some noise associated with these these variables, and and so we we choose to add some noise to those uh, to those two values as well. You know they're not they're not you know true values, but rather values with noise added. Um, and so here's an example prediction now with with the model that contains kind of those two added elements and. And uh, I think you'll see there's uh, obviously some improved scale, and, 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 and we can focus again specifically kind of on the center of the domain where our model really struggled with the first time. And, and you know, it, it's perhaps still a bit of a struggle. It's not perfect, but it, it's most definitely better than, than what we began with. And um, we can again look at the predicted probabilities and, and see it, it has very similar behavior where it's, um, you know, Quite often, confident in its prediction, and and perhaps some uh, lower portions of confidence around where it predicts the cloud edge to be. And then I'll I'll, I'll show the comparison of the confusion matrices, where um, you know our, our our true clear detection goes from 87 percent to 93 uh, percent. Our true cloud detection goes from 89 percent to to 92 percent. So both both. Uh, increasing our detection of clear scenes as well as those of cloudy scenes. Um, and then finally here we can we can kind of just compare these these 2D uh, screens again and and you'll you'll kind of see pretty much amongst all of our bins we, we see uh, aspects that correspond to increased scale where we're getting darker shades of blue uh, lower into the atmosphere than than what we were getting before as well as you know, for some of these lower bins, we're we're getting darker shades of blue, so greater confidence um, uh, at, at lower total or cap values as well. And, and specifically, if we you know sum along our our rows, we can see we're getting you know if, if the at least with the simulated data, if the, if the clouds occurring above 600 millibars, we're getting 95 to 100 percent detection. Um, and so. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and conclude. Um, we find, you know, the, the, these NNs appear to exhibit uh, be quite scopeful, even in these kind of difficult polar regions. Uh, I think we're, we're we're trying to be careful with, um, you know, having some kind of a eva final evaluation of skill, especially in comparison to, you know, operational cloud mass, because this is working with. You know, simulated data. I, I think it's quite, uh, you know, a, a sophisticated model, but it's it's still worth being careful about. Um, we find, you know, once you kind of get these models proof up, uh, they're they're quite easily to make changes to. And so, you know, for for example, uh, we we went about this procedure of optimizing this this total water path threshold, but you know, perhaps it's it's. It's not detecting thin enough clouds, but that bowl being as shallow as it is as it was, you could push that um, total water path to even thinner values, and then you wouldn't get much of a dock on scale. Um, and that's not a hard change to make. Uh, this this notion of weighting these classes is is, is uh, you know perhaps again something someone can take to their advantage. Where you know in this case we we weight our classes to be uh, equivalent in terms of importance of detecting, but uh, you know, perhaps you want to weight the cloud to be worth twice as much uh, for your model than, than a clear scene. You can, again, quite easily change that. 
Um, and then finally, these, these return confidences are actually quite intuitive to use and, and are, are likely a good way to kind of attach quality flags to these outputs. And so uh, in, in, in terms of future direction, uh, I imagine, uh, you know, one, the, uh, the bin ends kind of evaluate quite efficiently. So, you know, for example, our, our, our 8 million evaluation set takes, you know, a minute or two to evaluate on. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's not a huge doc to having perhaps some redundancies where, you know, maybe we train uh, kind of ensemble of, of these in ends to make these predictions and, and have small perturbations and see what happens. Or similarly with, with uh, kind of looking at different properties, it's, it's not especially hard to, you know, kind of take the in end that was created and, and simply plug and play with, you know, different inputs or outputs and, and maybe want to make a, a, an algorithm that's looking at in homogeneity, uh, in homogeneity within the field of view specifically, or, or uh, detecting the cloud edge, or predicting surface types, cloud pressure, cloud top pressures, etc. And so, uh, here's some some references, um, and then I'll happily take any any questions now. I had a question about the field of view geometry. So you're using a like just a square, just like like nine by nine kilometers or something. Mm -hmm. Is the actual the telescope is it is going to be circular? Uh, I I assume I assume it's going to be like somewhat uh, elliptical or something. It is actually more of a square. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just yeah, the way the the way the optics work, you okay. get a square okay. pretty much out of if it's for you, yeah. yeah. Well we can talk more about that later, but yeah. And I was gonna ask about a unit on your overlap thing, but if it's more of a square actually. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in any case we, we do actually try as well um uh different sizes of those patches. So, you know, we've used three by three, but I think we tried four by four and five by five, and it's actually uh, the, the, the evaluated scale is, is the same, essentially. Um, so it's not especially sensitive to those sizes as well. Can you give a neural network too much information? I don't know much about it. I mean, and when I say that, I mean, would it make sense to try removing some channel from, I mean, I think of other, types of retrievals where a channel might be adding more noise than signal. Does that apply to this sort of thing? I think it most definitely applies. I mean, uh, you can imagine in, in, in for the far infrared, like when we remove the far infrared case, for example, like if, if we were to only be looking at low clouds, that those increased inputs are essentially only adding noise to it. Um, and so ideally, you get the perfect amount of inputs that, you know, covers your kind of full span of cases that aren't contributing. Uh, you know, excess noise to to your model. Um, I think it's, you know, there's different techniques and ways to find the optimal inputs to have where you can remove them one at a time. Um, but yeah, I uh, I don't know if I beat around your question or not, but um, yeah. Good job. Hey, Ken, great job. So I saw that uh, in a couple of figures, you are using particular latitude band to train your model. Is that the only patch that you use, or like you train it across the? Field? No. Uh, yeah. So that was uh, just a particular example. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I th this would you know wrap around every single band yeah, of latitude. Yeah. So you cover the entire north pole. Mm -hmm. And then as well as the south, the south. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, for both. Arctic and the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. So, what sort of biases you think might be there in this algorithm, which I don't, I don't know if they're there or not, but it might be that there might be potential for different biases. Yeah. So, um, I guess kind of generally first, uh, you know, whatever biases or limitations that might be present within the simulation itself are, are going to creep into the model. Obviously, I, I mean, I. Uh, and, and that's why I'm, I'm you know, I, I try to be careful with the final evaluation of skill because this is all simulated data. But, uh, you know, if, if you were able to attend Monday's colloquium, one, you know, one of the points is even with observed data, there's there's going to be some biases on what you're evaluating as truth. You know, those, those 
uh, where your truth model or where your truth observation set struggles to detect clouds, that's going to be propagating through your, your model as well. Um, and so uh, I, I guess that's kind of broadly in terms of biases. I, I think I, I don't see really any biases in terms of um, when I look at, you know, the northern hemisphere skill versus the southern hemisphere skill, and I just kind of compare those separately, the, the loss is the same, or essentially the same, the accuracy is essentially the same. And I, I, again, I think that's an artifact of, of us training on both, both, you know, poles to begin with. And so that those kind of all those various different scene types are kind of baked into the model to start with. But yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete, sure. Question online from Paul Manzoli it says spectral cloud mask tests are aided by looking for inversions. Is this uh, is the NN approach able to use this also? I think that uh, you know, we're not explicitly saying look for inversions, but I would not be surprised if that's baked into the model in some way. You know, there's a bunch of parameters and or, or there's weights that are being trained and, and that wouldn't surprise me if that's you know i i can't conceptualize it but um it's i think would be based underneath the, the model working there yeah so uh, the, the regions where you kind of have those overlapping footprints so you're oversampling that specific region um i was wondering before you kind of merge those footprints together do you have like some sort of re uh, regime where you know that those footprints are cloudy before you start to average them? Uh, so are you talking about like the overlap? Yeah, really like the red, blue, and the green footprints and all the cloudy before you kind of average them together? Uh, so, I mean, prior we were kind of, you know, this overlapping, these overlapping footprints were occurring prior. It's, you know, an artifact of the sampling or the, the, the readout time. And so before we were kind of just, Taking these to be completely independent of one another, and and just predicting on the full print, footprint to begin with, um, we're not really necessarily feeding in any like first guesses or anything like that when when we're doing this kind of overlapping procedure. I think that so I I, I think uh, uh, predicting kind of on this uh, sub footprint scale is actually a bit of an advantage of this, where you know you could imagine um, in our in our baseline model. We're predicting on a pole footprint, uh, and we're saying whether that that footprint's uh, clear or cloudy, right? Uh, the next footprint, we're we're doing the same thing, and and I I, I don't necessarily know what what we do if if you know these oppose one another um, in, in their prediction, even though there's actually some area that that corresponds with, with each other, and so that's kind of another wrinkle we we have to decide. Okay. These oppose, or, or do we want to average kind of the prediction, prediction together in some way? Um, but with this overlapping procedure, we're we're only predicting like the 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 following footprints going to be predicting only on this this single column, and so you're not getting kind of those conflicting results perhaps. And so I think that is also an advantage perhaps of this. Okay. And then my, my second one is I know this is more for like the operational for the the the, uh, the cube sound, but It'd be really interesting to see how this compares to like the rodent cloud maps at high, high latitudes and see if it's using those, utilizing those kind of approach and it kind of help, you know, how that compares to the rodent. Yeah. Different. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think definitely a, a thing that we'll be doing when we have real observations and can, um, you know, truly evaluate against some other third independent party and seeing how it actually compares. Where we may maybe obtain more skill than other platforms. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, what was the last half? What's uh, the temporal resolution of the neural network and what? For say one group I, I don't know that because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can implement the temporal tracking of the data. If you know that it's moving, then obviously it's not. It's, it's oh, I see. So, what's what's the, uh, I think the, I mean, the satellite capture time is like 0.7 seconds or something in between each footprint, I, I want to say. Um, I don't. I mean, I, I haven't thought about that. That's I mean, that's that would be a cool project. I, I don't know if uh, 
that's a short enough amount of time to observe those differences. Because I mean, I'm imagining like, I'm imagining, for example, like a continuous cloud deck. Uh, if if you know you're in the middle of that and you're capturing the middle of that and it moves underneath you, it still just looks like a cloud, and so you're not maybe detecting it. There. It'd only be uh, picked up if if you're kind of detecting the cloud edge and then it moves away from the cloud edge and then you see the surface. Um, uh, and so I, I, I think, um, you know, maybe in those cases, you could try to do something like that. Um, I think we then have to be careful, though, of, you know, our, uh, I, I kind of show that our model's greatest uncertainty is, is in those locations where you're right near the top edge. So you start to get kind of these confounding effects, and, and I don't quite know um, how that would play out. Um, well, you may have said this in the very beginning. Uh, for your at least three output, what was the sort of time scale over which you're using to feed into your neural network? What I'm asking is like a year of data, like what do you like what, what amount of model output? So uh, I'm using one timestamp, so uh, it's like 03 UTC on August 1st or something to train the model and then using a distinct timestamp to um, uh, test the model data. Okay, so are you using a bunch of different timestamps? Then, like, I'm just wondering, like, how are there seasonal biases basically? And are you making that into this by doing the model? Are you testing the model with every different time of year? So, uh, right now, the simulated data, so like what we're training on is 03 UTC August 1st, and then what I'm testing on is just a single time stamp 09 UTC August 1st. Okay. And so, yeah, uh, I, I think that. You know, there is some worry that there might be some seasonal bias with just, you know, one day being fed in. But I think we do also have to consider that, you know, it, it's August. And uh, I think we're, you know, 60 degrees north in, in August looks quite different than 90 degrees south in, in, in August. And so I think we're actually sampling quite a range of, of conditions, okay. uh, even the fact that it's, you know, just a single time step. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you might have all said this, but is your uh, like total water column cut off? Is it light up to any dependence? Like, is there a temperature component to it, or is it just one number? Uh, the threshold for clear or cloudy? Yeah. Uh, it's just a single number. Would, would, would clouds have less total water in them when they're older, like close, closer to the pole? More uh, I think you typically get thinner clouds and in, in, uh, near the poles and you get more erosion. And then, so could you like have uh, a lot of the cut off the thing? Yeah, I mean, I I, I assume uh, we could uh, have various uh, cutoffs. I think um, uh, I I think there's. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we could. I think um, there's some niceness about having perhaps the simplicity of you know one single number that we're using for the whole globe, and, and you can imagine if, if someone's wanting to use this output, they they might have to be careful about okay, uh, these these. It, it's nice to be able to say okay, we're detecting clouds and we define clouds as such, um, and I think then if someone's using these outputs and they're, and they're saying okay, what's a cloud? Uh, you've then got to start to say, okay, a cloud's this if it's at this latitude, a cloud's this if it's at this latitude. And, and, you know, perhaps that some people like that, some people don't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other online questions, Steve? Or? Nope. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for attending and thanks for coming.